Mention Ireland and a whole host of stereotypical images will readily spring to mind. Lush green fields, quaint whitewashed cottages, pubs, traditional music and witty repartee all have a role to play in the rest of the world's romantic notion of the place. But there's far more to Ireland than leprechauns, fiddles and poetic literature. And even the most cursory glance at the country's political and social history will paint a far more complex and on occasion deeply troubled picture. Yet this is a nation that has grown strong and determined, striding boldly into the 21st century, taking its place in modern Europe as a force to be reckoned with. Whether in terms of tourism or manufacturing, there is, after all, nothing you can do to change history. But what the Irish people intrinsically possess is a rare talent for breathing new life into the past, forging something positive from even the most negative of events. This is never more true than in the province of Irish drinking, a subject that is without doubt dear to the heart of many a true native, not to mention the refined palates of connoisseurs of such things the whole world over. The Irish are a convivial race, and sharing a drink in the local pub is as much part of today's social culture as it's ever been. For plenty of folk, the black velvet pint of Guinness with its creamy white head is the preferred tipple. But a measure of fine, smooth Irish whiskey has never been known to go amiss, despite its Scottish namesake having a much higher profile beyond the shores of the Emerald Isle. And of course, who could miss out on the ubiquitous Irish coffee with its great warming qualities? The precursor of the magical marriage of flavours that dominate the more recently invented Irish cream liqueurs. The choice is wide indeed, and in the lively atmosphere of a sociable bar, the talk will soon be flowing as freely as the drink, while stories, tall tales and a generous sprinkling of Celtic culture gently wraps you round. program has been designed to take you on a tour of this wonderful phenomenon, now so much a treasured part of life in Ireland, as well as having been exported across the Atlantic and even further afield. Irish pubs are certainly to be found by travellers everywhere, but you don't even need to find one of these to sample the liquid assets of Ireland. The divine Irish whiskies, evoking the spirit of tradition, combined with all the promise of the future, line heavily laden bar shelves worldwide. Such great and well-respected names as Jameson call upon busy folk as far divided as Rome, New York and Tokyo to take it easy, asking, what's the rush? A wonderful advertising slogan that sums up the ethos of this superb whiskey. And of course, there are few bars anywhere, whichever far-flung corner of the world you happen to find yourself in, that don't serve the instantly recognisable pint of Guinness. Last destination on this most salubrious of tours has to be Dublin, Ireland's capital city where up to a third of the Republic's population live. Joined each year by many thousands of visitors who arrive by land, sea or air to discover the joys of the Emerald Isle for themselves. Amongst the great variety of tourist attractions including the voluptuous statue of Molly Malone, O'Connell Street and Temple Bar you'll find two absolute gems of relatively recent addition to Dublin's esteemed guidebooks, with roots firmly embedded in the international city's past. For many people, when you talk about Irish drinks, the first thought that will come to mind will be the rich image of a glass of Guinness. There are perhaps two reasons for this. Firstly, internationally speaking, 
whisky is often more generally associated with Scotland than it is with Ireland and secondly, the advertising campaigns produced by Guinness are almost as famous as the drink itself. The first posters appeared in 1929 and as this early Christmas special illustrates, humour and imagination have always been a vital part of the scheme. A very successful tradition that continues to this day. This is the Guinness Storehouse, a spectacular new visitor attraction that is an absolute must on any tour of the city. The Guinness Brewery, the largest brewery in Europe, covers an astronomical 65 acres of central Dublin and is responsible for manufacturing and exporting the most famous stout in the world to 120 countries. The storehouse itself, a historically listed building dating back to 1904, covers almost four acres and from the moment you walk in through the main entrance, the size of this six-floor, modern, yet historical presentation is overwhelming. On first impression, it's as if you've walked into a large pint glass, and there at your feet, you will see the 9,000-year lease, which the 34-year-old man of vision, Arthur Guinness, signed in December 1759, when he took over St. James's Gate Brewery. The annual rent was meant to be £45, and although this sounds a pittance by modern standards, it was a serious undertaking at the time, because brewing in Dublin was at a pretty much all-time low. The St. James's Gate Brewery had lain idle in point of fact for some 10 years previous to this. Ale brewed in the city was of a very poor standard, and was almost unknown in rural communities where whiskey, gin or pachin, a highly illegal home-brewed spirit that can still blow your socks off if you happen upon some, were all far more popular. However, ale is what Arthur Guinness started off with, but a new black beer was being produced in London and caught the great man's entrepreneurial interest. It was called Porter, because the porters of the huge London markets most enthusiastically favoured the drink. Arthur Guinness quickly devised his own recipe for the porter, and production began. Today we describe this beer as stout, but this is a relatively modern term that wasn't adopted until the 1920s. Arthur Guinness had a tough decision to take, which he did by bravely backing his instincts totally ceasing the production of ale to concentrate solely on black beer. It was a move that paid dividends as early as 1769, when the first export shipment of Guinness left the Dublin factory, a tradition that has of course been maintained in some style ever since. Now when you come to the storehouse, don't expect to wander past the series of contrived exhibits with do not touch labels all over the place. The first images to literally assault your senses are the raw ingredients used to make Guinness. Water has never been displayed so dramatically and it's worth pointing out here that the H2O so vital to the manufacture of Guinness does not, as has been popularly believed, come from the River Liffey, but from crystal clear sources high up in the nearby Wicklow Mountains. Barley is prepared in three ways, flaked, roasted and malted, before being ground together into grist and mixed with hot water in a mashed tun, uniquely known in Ireland as a keeve. So far the process is very similar to that of whiskey making, which we'll discover more about a little later. But things differ greatly at the next stage, when hops are added and the whole concoction is boiled to a colossally high temperature. After cooling, yeast is the next ingredient to join the mix, and fermentation then takes place over the next 48 hour period. This is the point at which you have stout, but to become Guinness, it is then matured and conditioned for a further 10 days before being pumped into tankers or kegs for distribution both near and far. The 
sights, sounds and even smells have been reproduced here to great effect and you really do get a true taste of what it would have been like to have worked in Arthur Guinness's brewery all those years ago. And talking of taste, the absolute highlight of this tour is saved until last. Step inside the glass elevator and you'll be whisked skyward to the amazing Guinness Gravity Bar. The epitome of modern elegance, this glass-walled room affords you perhaps the best view of Dublin to be found anywhere. And it's here that you'll get the opportunity to taste a pint of Guinness, poured by master bar staff, who have perfected the presentation of this heady brew to an absolute art form. You just can't hurry a pint of Guinness, so be patient, because there are six stages to be undertaken before your drink will be served. Firstly, the glass is of vital importance. It must be cool, dry and spotlessly clean. Secondly, the angle at which the glass is to be held to the tap must be at 45 degrees. Thirdly, the pour must be steady and sure, the handle fully forward until the glass is almost full. Fourthly, the pint must be allowed to settle until it becomes perfectly black with its distinct white creamy head. The fifth stage is the top up, when the handle is pushed back until the glass is full. And then the last stage is the presentation of the perfect pint of Guinness. A steady hand is an absolute must to ensure there is no overspill. And there you have it. One of Ireland's greatest delicacies served in the surroundings which literally reflect many of the major events in the nation's history, commemorated by Dublin's most famous landmarks. But don't feel left out. Guinness comes in bottles too. And if you pour yourself on with as much care as you can muster, the finished result will be equally pleasant. The main difference will be in the head of the drink. As there's no nitrogen in the bottle, you'll get a frothy head rather than a creamy texture of the draft version. There are still many older drinkers who much prefer the bottles of Guinness because it's what they were used to in their younger days when this was the only way that Guinness was served. Make sure you allow plenty of time to visit the Guinness storehouse because there is an incredible amount to see. And of course, once you're settled in the gravity bar with your perfectly pulled pint of Guinness, watching the hustle and bustle of Dublin going on far beneath you, you'll find little to tempt you to rush away. But rush we must, as on this tour at any rate, it's time to head across the River Liffey to a slightly more northerly district of Dublin, in search of real Irish whiskey. However, while we have such a good view of the city, we'll take a look at where we're going. You can't miss St. Patrick's Windmill, minus arms, that marks the spot of the long gone Thomas Street Distillery. But just beyond it, you can certainly see the distinctive towers of the old Jameson distillery, which although no longer producing whiskey on site, is very much alive and well, continuing the fascinating story of Dublin whiskey in first class style. Welcome to Bow Street Soul Jameson Distillery. A revolutionary blend of past, present and future, which really does prove that history is alive and well safe in the hands of Irish distillers. Blending fact and fascination with all the skill you'd expect from such fine whiskey makers. The man who gave his name to Ireland's most successfully enduring whiskey, John Jameson opened his Bow Street Distillery in 1780 
an enterprising Scotsman who saw the potential in Dublin's fair city for whisky production. He founded a family dynasty that would most certainly weather the major tests of time. Today, you'll find a superb exhibition here, which tells you not only the incredible story of John Jameson, but also gives you the history of whisky making in Ireland as well. So, before we follow in the erstwhile footsteps of the first in the long line of Jamesons to produce the water of life from these Bow Street premises, we'll take a brief moment to contemplate how this remarkable land came to be the birthplace of whisky distilling after travelling Irish monks brought home the precious secrets of Arabian alchemy. Although it's impossible to precisely pinpoint the origins of whisky, it's pretty much accepted that from the 6th century onwards, Irish monks were distilling a drinkable spirit from malted barley in pot stills, similar in shape to the alembics that the Arabs have been using for the distillation of perfume. The fact that both the Scots and the Irish use the same word for this liquor is due to the shared similarities of each country's version of Gaelic, both pronouncing Ishgaba to be the water of life. Gradually, over time, this became anglicised as whisky for both nations. Although the Irish whisky is always spelled with an E, while traditional Scotch always lacks this additional vowel. With plentiful supplies of soft, pure water and quality barley, rural Ireland quickly appreciated how to make use of its natural resources. And of course, good news travels fast, even in the Dark Ages. And when the Scots were visited by Irish missionaries, the secrets of distillation were also conveyed. If you travel to the north of the country today, you'll find Old Bushmills Distillery, which claims to be the oldest distillery in the world, just a stone's throw from the dramatic Giant's Causeway. The story goes that the legendary Finn McCool Irish giant of epic proportions, built the landmark in an attempt to reach a fairer Scottish giantess who had taken his fancy across the sea. Now from here on a clear day, you can see Eilie, that great bastion of Scotch whisky production, a mere 16 miles away. So it's hardly surprising that the Scots and the Irish have a shared heritage in more than a few respects. Documentation referring to Irish whisky dates right back to the early 1500s when it was said that Eshgabar, if taken in moderation, sloweth age, strengthen youth, helps digestion, cutteth phlegm, abandoneth melancholy, relish the heart, lighteneth the mind, and quicken the spirit. Praise indeed for the fine concoction that was being produced the length and breadth of the country. Even the English, who had already come to blows with their Irish neighbours on a number of occasions, appreciated the quality of this heady brew, with Queen Elizabeth I renowned for enjoying a drop of Irish whisky. Her great favourite, Sir Walter Raleigh, who had more than a few Irish connections of his own, was delighted when she gave him a gift of a 32-gallon keg of the stuff in 1617, without doubt an honour for such an adventurer. However, by the end of the century, attention from across the Irish Sea was definitely not as welcome as Her Majesty's regal seal of approval. After the Great Queen's death and the unification of England and Scotland, great political turmoil arose, resulting in the Civil War, which turned Parliament, led by Oliver Cromwell, against the Crown. Historically speaking, Cromwell was not a favourite with the Irish as he was responsible for the massacre of thousands of their number in reprisal attacks on royalist supporters during the siege of Drogheda. What's more, the effect of Cromwell's civil uprising had dramatic consequences in other ways for the people of Ireland. And to be more precise, their whisky making. The aftermath of the conflict left the British Treasury chronically short of funds and ways were sought to raise cash. 
Neither Irish nor Scottish whisky escaped the notice of the taxman, and a levy of four pence a gallon was charged. For the 2,000 Irish stills bubbling across the land, this really was adding insult to injury, and many of the wilder whisky men took to the hills, preferring to avoid the payment of duty. When an excise office was opened in Dublin, and custom officials were dispatched to root out illegal production, the battle lines were drawn. Entire communities resisted the strictures, as the farmers producing the barley were as much a part of the process as the distillers. And the profession of an excise man was a dangerous one indeed, with feelings of indignation running lethally high. It took many years for the legislation to become workable, and by the time John Jameson set foot in Dublin, things were still rather chaotic. Although the Excise Act of 1823 went a long way to stabilising the process, predominantly to the advantage of the bigger producers, stills with less than 40 gallon capacity were outlawed, as it was thought that these were the most likely to be operated illegally. John Jameson and the other major distillers certainly seized the opportunity to increase the size of their operations. The Irish whisky industry was soon riding high, and despite being fewer producers, the output of spirit was consistently plentiful and of excellent quality. This is a good moment to define the differences between Scotch and Irish whiskies, because a significant development was on the horizon that would change the international perception of the drink forever. Basically, the Irish whisky process involves taking barley, which is then malted and dried in closed kilns, in Scotland, peat is used to dry the malted barleys at this stage, imparting a smoky flavour to the finished whisky. Whereas an Irish whisky, such as Jameson, is much smoother and has none of the smoked peaty character of the Scotch. Then the Irish whisky is distilled three times against the Scottish double distillation process. This again imparts a smoothness to the Irish whisky, taking out a degree of that fire that you find in its Scottish counterpart. It isn't to say that one is better than the other, though if you ask a native of each land, they may well have a strong opinion to the contrary. It's just to say that Scotch and Irish whiskies are very different drinks, and at the end of the day, it all comes down to personal taste. Dr. Johnson, the influential English writer, who launched his dictionary in 1755, included a definition of whisky, or Ishgabar, as it was then listed. The Irish sort is particularly distinguished for its pleasant and mild flavour. In Scotland, it is somewhat hotter. This easier drinkability of the Irish version assured a wide market interest, whereas Scotch single malts were more suited to those who had acquired a taste for it. But this was all to change in favour of the Scotch export market during the 1830s, due, ironically, to the invention of a retired Irish excise man turned distiller, who was once beaten to within an inch of his life by illegal whisky makers. Aeneas Coffey offered his invention, the paint and still, which continuously distilled up to 200 gallons of spirit an hour to the big Irish distilleries. They treated his creation with scorn, insisting that real Irish whisky could only be made traditionally in pot stills. Striking a blow for authenticity may well have been their intention, but the Irish distillers, shutting their doors to Kofi, simply served to send the Irishmen to Scotland to see if they could make use of his brainchild. The canny Scottish distillers were delighted with the light grain spirit that Kofi still produced and with an eye firmly fixed upon lucrative export markets, used the mellow concoction to cool the fire of the fine, but sometimes fierce, Scottish malts. Blended Scotch whisky was born, and with such characters as Johnny Walker, the Kilmarnock grocer, trailblazing the new product, over a period of years it overtook all other whiskies in popularity stakes, despite the fact that today's whisky connoisseurs are often in the habit of overlooking blended Scotch brands.
As the 20th century dawned, further obstacles beset the Irish distillers. But these problems, unlike the rejection of Cofe's patent still, were most definitely not of their own making. The Easter Uprising of 1916 served the British government with a salutary warning of Ireland's determination to become a free state. And after much bloodshed, this goal was finally achieved in 1922. But the residual British bad feeling denied the Irish whisky distillers access to the very valuable export markets of the still far-reaching empire, causing sales to plummet. And worse was still to come as prohibition laws in America shut down further export possibilities completely. Prohibition, known in America as the Noble Experiment, ran from 1920 to 1933, quite literally prohibiting the manufacture, transportation and sale of alcohol. This was a terrible blow for Irish whiskey which had been popular across the Atlantic, due in part to the high number of Irish Americans whose relatives had fled to the USA over the centuries during times of hardship, most notably in the potato famine in the mid-1850s. A taste of the old country was a nostalgic treat, even for the new generations who had never set foot upon Irish soil. Despite the post-war American government's moralistic intentions, the experiment proved to say the least to be counterproductive. Alcohol simply went black market, and drinking dens run by gangsters resulted in organised crime rising to hitherto unknown levels. Unfortunately for Irish whisky distillers, every bootleg potion concocted in any old backstreet tended to be labelled Irish whisky. And even when prohibition was abandoned 13 years after its misconception, Irish whisky had acquired such a bad name that new imports of the genuine article were still rejected. The middle years of the 20th century were tough going for even the biggest Irish whisky names, and recovery of the previous export market share was a difficult task. At home in Ireland, whisky was as popular as ever, but this was never going to keep the industry alive. However, in 1966, steps were instigated by individual distilleries to join forces and take on the world. Jameson and Powers from Dublin merged with the Cork Distilleries Company, itself an amalgamation of four local distilleries, and the Irish Distillers Group took shape. Success did not come overnight and many changes were required, including the streamlining and the pooling of resources. brand new distillery building at Middleton on the outskirts of Cork eventually took on production for the whole group. But when Bushmills joined the association in 1972, they did retain their distillery at the County Antrim site. By the early 1980s, the benefits of the years of hard work started to pay off. But the age-old necessity for access to a well-established export market proved elusive as ever. And so it was that the French-owned drinks group, Pernod Ricard, came into the picture, buying the Irish distillers group to everyone's mutual advantage, transforming the resurging whisky market beyond recognition. Success was dramatic, and by 1995, the annual world sales of Jameson topped the 10 million bottles mark. As it earned due recognition as one of the world's top 100 spirit brands, 
which brings us pretty much up to the present day. And of course this brief history has been rushed through at speed, dealing with some of Ireland's major developments in a matter of moments. But this, after all, is a programme dedicated to great Irish drinks, and it's high time we headed for the bar. A visit to Old Jameson in Bow Street is fascinating, as you've seen during our brief history lesson. But for most people, the really important part of this guided tour brings them to this bar, where they can sample a variety of whiskies with their history firmly rooted in this remarkable location. Here is a very rudimentary guide to the whiskies with a fine Dublin pedigree that you must really try for yourselves. First and foremost is the world famous Jameson, internationally acclaimed and continuing to grow in reputation quite literally as we speak. Even if you've never tasted whiskey before in your life, this blend is wonderfully accommodating. Creamly smooth, with a mellow sweetness balanced by fresher floral notes, this whisky has much to recommend it. But you'll also detect some mild woodiness with a definite sherry kick. There are those who describe this as the true spirit of Ireland, and it would be hard to find a better way of summing up this most precious example of the country's heritage. There are other Jameson's brands to look out for, including the 12-year-old, the 1780 and Jameson Gold. A very special treat is the old Jameson Distillery 12 year old reserve, which is rich, smooth and sherried with a most pleasant dry note in the finish. Red Breast is another speciality to look out for, with Jameson whiskies being traditionally used for this 12 year old pure pot still Irish brand. It's not the easiest of whiskies to find, but it's well worth the effort as this is a fine full-bodied tipple with a ripe sherried character and an almost spicy flavour that really does enliven the palate. For anyone who's never visited the Emerald Isle, he'd be forgiven perhaps for not recognising the Powers Irish whisky label, but for the home market this is a great great favourite. Power and Son originated in Dublin in 1791 and rapidly developed as one of the most progressive of the distilleries. Up until the late 19th century, all Irish whisky was sold to customers in casks. But when Powers pioneered bottling on site, they not only prevented this product being adulterated by bar owners and unscrupulous merchants, but also succeeded in expanding their marketplace to include domestic customers who could then carry their whisky home by means other than ingestion. Powers took this a step further by introducing a miniature bottle of whisky, a trend that quickly caught on with competitors and has continued to this day. It was claimed that the baby power, as it was fondly described, had a three swallow capacity, evidently enough to encourage a liking for a full size version. But if you get a chance, do give the Powers a try because it does have a unique character all of its own. This whisky is fresh and smooth, but with masses of luscious peachiness combined with rich multi flavours and a pleasantly surprising dry finish. The gold label is distinctive, and as well as the standard brand, there's also a Powers 12 year old, which is even more delightfully rich. By the time you're ready to leave the old Jameson distillery, not only will you have a good understanding of both the history and the practicalities of the Irish whisky making process, but you'll also have had your appetite well and truly whetted, setting you off on an Irish whisky trail of your very own. Oh, as I was going over the Cock and Kerry Mountains, 
I met Captain Farrell and his money he was counting. I first produced my pistol and then produced my rapier, saying, Shand and deliver for the devil he may take ya. Wish her in Ramadu Ramadar. Whack ball, my daddy o Whack ball, my daddy o There's whiskey in the jar. I counted out his money and it made a pretty penny. I put it in my pocket and I brought it home to Jenny. She swore she'd never leave me. Well, never would she deceive me. The devil take that woman and all you never would be easy for sure in Ramadu Ramadar. Whack ball, my daddy o Whack ball, my daddy o There's whiskey in the jar. Whack ball, my daddy o Whack ball, my daddy o There's whiskey in the jar. Well, being drunk and weary, I went to Jenna's chamber and taking Jenna with me. Now I never knew the danger. At about six or seven, well, in came Captain Farrell and firing both my pistols, I killed him with both barrels. For sure, in Ramadu Ramadar. Whack ball, my daddy o Whack ball, my daddy o There's whiskey in the jar. Well, some men they like fishing, and some men they like fowling, and some men like to hear a cannonball a rolling. Now me, I just like sleeping, especially in Jenna's chamber. Yet here I am in prison, here I am with a ball and cane, yeah. Wish her rum rum a doo rum a dar. Whack ball, my daddy o, whack ball, my daddy o, there's whiskey in the jar. Here we go! Yeah! Ramadu Ramadar, whack ball, my daddy o, whack ball, my daddy o. There's whiskey in the jar. Well, if any man can save me, it's my brother in the army. If I could find a station down in Concord and Killarney, well, I'm sure he'll come and join me. We'll go roaming in Kilkenny. I'll engage to treat me sweeter than me dearest darling Jenny. For sure in Ramadu Ramadar, whack ball, my daddy o, whack ball, my daddy o. There's whiskey in the jar. For sure in Ramadu Ramadar. Whack for my daddy o, whack for my daddy o. There's whiskey in the jar. Our next destination takes us all the way to Northern Ireland, leaving Dublin and its delightful whiskies far behind us. We're heading off for the old Bushmills Distillery. And if it's a journey that you'd like to make yourself, just head for the Giant Causeway and you can't miss the old Bushmill signposts. This stretch of Antrim coastline, although admittedly dominated by the amazing rock formations, is also perfect whisky making country, with an abundance of soft rolling pasture land and clear unpolluted small rivers. Of all the distilleries that you'll find, whether Irish or Scottish, Old Bushmills is unquestionably one of the most picturesque. Built on the banks of St. Cullum's Rill, which flows into the River Bush, the water supply continues undisturbed, as it has, quite literally, for centuries. The first grant to distill at Bushmills, courtesy of King James I, dates back to 1608, but whisky making is actually thought to have been significant here since the 13th century. Nevertheless, the official 17th century documentation does effectively make this the oldest distillery in the world. And even more importantly, whisky is still being made here. And it's likely to remain in production for as many centuries again to come. On first impressions, Old Bushmills has more than a look of Victorian Speyside Scotland about it, which is due to a terrible fire that destroyed much of the distillery in 1855. Rebuilding was of course in the style of the period, including the beautiful Bogoda Towers which contribute greatly to the attractive look of the place.
However, despite the success of this great Irish distillery, unlike the hundreds of others now lost in the mists of time, it hasn't been an easy history that has brought Bushmill through to the present day. Local competition was once very fierce, and when Bushmills was founded as a company in 1783, the potheen trade, although highly illegal, was very productive in this area. With peaks and troughs in trading for hundreds of years, there have been a number of closures and reopenings, but whatever, Bushmills has stood the test of time. Naturally, the stability offered by joining the Irish Distillers Group in the 1970s and the subsequent takeover by Purnell Ricard has been just what was required for this most treasured part of Ireland's heritage to continue into the 21st century and beyond. The major difference that you will notice between Old Jameson in Dublin and Old Bushmills is the delightful fact that here you are entering a fully operational distillery. Your tour guide will actually take you through the production line and sights, sounds and smells are for real. This is a living, breathing entity and what better opportunity could we have to take a closer look at how Irish whiskey is made. As with all Irish whisky making, we begin with the barley, which in most cases is a mix between malted and unmalted. However, Bushmills is an exception, because it is a malt distillery, using only the malted variety. After drying the malt in closed kilns, milling will take place and the grist is then mixed with hot water in the mash tun, the huge vessel that you see here. Now here's the clever bit. The starches in the mash are converted into liquid known as wort, which is in turn pumped into these huge high-tech washbacks, where yeast is added and fermentation can begin. At the end of this stage, you now have a low-strength alcoholic brew that is now ready for a magical transformation to take place. This is the heart of the distillery, where the shining copper pot stills, unchanged almost since the dawn of time, hiss, bubble and steam the lifeblood into the whiskey. Now, as we've mentioned already, there are three distillations in this process. Firstly, the wash still refines the alcohol into low wines. Then the faint still continues the process with the second distillation. And lastly, the spirit still will complete the task. But surprisingly as it may sound, the finished product is still not whiskey, even after all this effort. One of the most important craftsmen that you'll find at any distillery is the cooper, remarkably skilled in the ancient tradition of barrel making and restoration. Whiskey, whether Irish or Scottish, must be matured for at least three years in casks to earn the right to be called so. And it is this process that turns the raw, clear alcohol into whiskey. At Bushmills, the oak casks used will previously been filled with sherry or American bourbon. This gives extra depth of flavour to the whiskey and also the glorious golden colour will develop during this time. Despite there being so many technological advances in the whisky making process, you'll never replace the age-old skills required for the making and seasoning of barrels. 
but once the task has been completed, it's time to move on to the next stage. You'll never in all your life have seen anything quite like an Irish whiskey warehouse, with barrels stacked sky high as far as the eye can see. The aroma that greets you is impossible to describe, but it is without doubt one of the most delightful smells you're ever likely to experience. What the astute nose can actually detect is the angel share, a phenomenon that is crucial to the whiskey making art. As the spirit lies dormant in its cask, air filters in through the semi-permeable oak and alcohol evaporates out to become the angel share. Today, these warehouses are guarded, as you would expect, with extreme care. But you can't help wondering how much of the lost spirit put down to the angel share in ages past actually drifted heavenward, and how much of it might have been consumed in a far more earthly fashion, and just blamed upon the angels, who could not of course be called upon for questioning. Once the waiting game is over, and the various casks of what can now be rightly called whiskey are ready, another skilled craftsman is called into the play, namely the blender, who combines the whiskies from different barrels together to achieve consistency in the variety of brands produced. After maturation in huge vats, the whiskey is then ready to be called upon for bottling at any time. Here at Bushmills, you can actually see bottling in progress, a mesmerizing activity indeed particularly when you know what comes next on this absolutely fascinating tour. There's just one place to go now, the aptly named 1608 bar for a spot of whiskey sampling. And we'll give you just a brief taste of what to expect from the much respected Bushmills name. Perhaps the best known of all the Bushmills brands is the premier Black Bush Blend, winner of a gold medal at the International Wine and Spirit Competition in London. This is a quality product capable of taking on the world. This whiskey is smooth and silky soft, balancing maltiness with a mellow sherry sweet finish. And although it would be most definitely appreciated by the worthy connoisseur, equally the less experienced whiskey taster is in for a treat as well. Also look out for the Bushmills 10 year old malt, another world beater in competition that has a clean crisp taste with hints of apple blossom, clover and bran. The finish is pleasingly dry with an overall softness and once you've tried this particular whiskey, the next step has to be the Bushmills 16 year old 3 wood single malt. Your taste buds are in for a treat with this well balanced full bodied malty sweet sherry delicacy. The reference to the 3 wood is due to the different casks used throughout the maturation. Firstly a 50% bourbon wood is used, secondly 50% sherry and then it is finished in port pipes for the last year and a half, all of which significantly characterizes this wonderful whiskey. Now, on our tour of great Irish drinks so far, we've talked a lot about the way whiskey is tasted, and for the novice, it can perhaps be just a little confusing. All you really need to remember is to consider three things the smell, or the nose as this is sometimes called, the taste and the after effects. And no, that doesn't mean whether you fall over or not. Take time to experience the aroma and only take a small sip, allowing it to roll around the mouth before swallowing. Then wait, because you will find the whiskey has an aftertaste, altering on the palate and quite often finishing very differently to how it started. But as we reluctantly prepare to leave the delights of old Bushmills behind us, we'll show you how the experts do it. 
Time for the rendezvous in one of Bushmill's most sacred corners as Colm Egan, head distiller, and Billy Layton, the warehouse manager, give a sample of the company's liquid assets, a thorough tasting. And now we get to the most exciting part of my day, where we get to sample the spirit after spending 21 years in this old cask. So Billy is going to remove the bung and take a sample off the spirit inside using the valenche. So having removed the sample, we need to take a sniff, which Billy is going to help me do. And then we need to take a taste. Mmm. Full bodied, rounded, real Madeira notes. Yeah. You get the influence of the Madeira there with the, uh, the fruitiness, the sweetness, a bit of chocolate, the caramel there. Um, I think that's the one for us. Ah. 21 year old malt, exquisite product. Cheers. In the merry month of May, from first to home, I started, left the girls a tune, so sad and broken, had to salute it, father dear. Kiss me, darling mother, drank a pint of beer, my grief and tears to smother the nap, to reap the con, leave her I was born, cut the stout back on, the banished ghost and goblin, brand new pair of brogues, rattling over the bogs, frightening all the dogs, on the rocky road to Dublin, one, two, three, four, five, hunt the hare and turn it down the rocky road, and all the way for Dublin, back for Aldi The next arrived, I thought it such a pity Soon to be deprived, a view of that fine city When I took a stroll, all among the quality Something from me stole, in the deep locality Something crossed me mind, when I looked behind A bundle could I find, a bundle stick A wobbling choir in for the road They sent me Connick Bro, who was a much in vogue Up the rocky road to Dublin, one, two, three, four, five Up the air and turn and down the rocky road And all the way from Dublin, back for Aldi There I got away, my spirit never failing Landed on the quay just as the ship was sailing The captain at me roared, said the room paddy Soon I jumped aboard a cabin found for paddy Down upon the pigs, played some party rigs Danced some party jigs, the water round me bubbling up the holly head I wish myself was dead, or better far instead On the rocky road to Dublin, one, two, three, four, five Up the hair and turn and down the rocky road And all the way for Dublin, one, where I'll be down Our next destination takes us southward, to almost the centre of Ireland, the pleasant village of Kilbegan, where you will discover one of the most fascinating Irish whisky stories ever told. This is Locke's Distillery. Today, a wonderful working museum that captures the very essence of the many small distilleries that were, in the industry's heyday, scattered throughout the Irish countryside. Mm -hmm. 
Interestingly, they can also claim to be the oldest licensed whiskey distillery in the world. But of course, as all Bushmills remains in production to this day, it is indisputably Ireland's oldest working distillery. Although a license was granted, as we've already heard, for distilling in the Bushmills area in 1608, the champions of the Kilbegan cars point out that the first documentary evidence of legal whiskey at Old Bushnose dates from 1784, giving the Kilbegan distillery senior status with production legitimately beginning here in 1757, hence making for the contradictory claim. But whichever way you look at it, historical technicalities won't spoil your enjoyment of this charming living exhibition which has plenty of surprises in store for the many visitors that pass this way on the Irish Whiskey Trail. It's hard to believe that just some 20 years ago this distillery had fallen into almost complete disrepair, becoming an eyesore that did nothing to encourage anyone to stop at Kilbegan. The village folk got together and took matters into their own hands forming a voluntary group to restore this lovely building. A 99-year lease, costing the grand sum of one pound a year, was signed with the landlords, and the evidence of the project's success stands before you now as a testament to Kilbegan's forward-thinking communal endeavours. Every single person that works here, or is involved on a day-to-day -day basis, cares passionately about the place and the welcome you'll receive is second to none. But this is not the first time that the villagers have stepped in to save their distillery. It's a time-honoured tradition, as you're about to discover. The first John Locke took over this distillery in 1843 and prospered, in part due to the great natural attributes of the district. A ready supply of turf kept the boilers well stoked, local grain was always available, and the beautiful river Brosna provided a steady flow of the purest, clearest water. However, John Locke's enlightened attitude towards man management skills proved to be of equally vital importance. The Locks were considered to be good employers, and workers here enjoyed many benefits. Cottages were provided for either rental or assisted purchase, and if the men had no land of their own, they were permitted to graze their animals while at work in the cow and calf park at the back of the distillery. They were also entitled to a full delivery of coal at the beginning of winter, courtesy of Lux, and pay for it in instalments throughout the year. Management, it is said, would often turn a blind eye when it came to perhaps less traditional perks that the locks workers were apt to indulge in. Here you see the brewing vats, in which boiling water was heated for the mash tun, and if stories are to be believed, the men would strip off and jump in for a quick bath before the water got too hot. They would also keep a jam jar on a string about their person for dropping into the wash bags for a swig of the already potent wash brew or pig ale as they called it, before it was pumped to the cup of pot stills for distillation. A baby's bottle on a string was equally useful. It was the perfect size to drop in through the bung holes of filled casks, for a whiskey tipple to help a working man through his shift. Not that locks were ungenerous in this respect, with each employee receiving a two shot a day allowance, right up until the turn of the 20th century. Such generosity on the part of the locks paid off in 1866, when the distillery's boiler blew up. John Locke did not have the wherewithal to replace it, and in desperate straits it looked as if he would have to close production down. If you step into the restaurant, as a by and by, the homemade food is some of the best you'll find in Ireland, you'll immediately see a plaque commemorating what happened next. The people of Kilbegan collected together enough money to buy a new boiler, which they then presented to John Locke, allowing the distillation of his whiskey to continue undisturbed. Mm -hmm. 
However, when the problems we've already talked about at length hit the Irish whisky industry in the 20th century, even the great public spirit of Kilbegan could do nothing to prevent the closure in 1957. But don't imagine that you'll be allowed to leave Locke's Museum without tasting a drop of good old Irish whisky. Sure, you've only heard half the story. In 1989, a group of like-minded businessmen got together to form Cooley a distillery intent on reviving some of the oldest brand names in Irish whisky that are in danger of disappearing altogether, including both Kilbegan and Lox. It was no easy task. Setting up a modern day distillery is an expensive business, not least because you have to lay down your stock for a minimum of three years before you can even begin to recover your costs. But persevere they did, and much to the benefit of everyone Cooley now ages its fine whiskies in the old warehouses in the Lox Museum site. It's still early days for the Cooley stable of whiskies, and who can begin to guess what the future might hold? But one thing's for certain, the whisky is getting better with every year that passes. And while you're enjoying a step back into the past at Lox Museum, You'll also get the opportunity to appreciate a taste of the future when you get to the bar. Your first taste here has to be Lox Single Malt, a smooth, full-flavoured whisky that is more akin to Scotch than other Irish brands, with its delicate hint of peat. Kilbegan is clean tasting with a faintly grassy quality. This is a sweet, remarkably smooth blend that suits a wide range of palates. The label of Tyrconnell's single malt commemorates the famous victory by the racehorse Tyrconnell at incredible odds in 1876. And a lot has certainly been gambled upon the fortunes of this recent revival. Just like a racehorse, this whisky is young and lively, but be assured there's no danger of an unexpected kicking from this one. The overall character is sweet, smooth and mellow and the whole experience is complemented by a pleasingly dry finish. Look out also for the Connemara Single Malt. This is even more peat smoked than Lux and has the unique distinction of being Ireland's only whisky advertised as being a peated single malt. This is one of Cooley's newest brands aimed at offering something different to the Irish whisky market. So watch this space. There is a Connemara cask strength brew as well. And if you're feeling brave and you haven't got to drive, give this a try as well. But as it's great Irish drinks that we're enjoying in this program, there's another new departure here worth taking a shot at. This is Elbana, an Irish whiskey liqueur with a rich texture and creamy, nutty sweet flavour. It was launched in 1994 and is proving to be a very popular variation on a theme. Leaving all the breweries and distilleries on this tour has been hard, as even after just a few hours you can feel really at home sampling the excellent produce on offer. Not that this should really come as any surprise, after all, the Irish are renowned the world over for their generous hospitality. And our next port of call will certainly confirm this. Well, there were three old ships kept to our hall door. They came brave up 
portfolio And the one sang higher than the other sang low And the ladies on the rack are like a gypsy -o. Well, she slipped up a dress of finest silk And put on a hose of a leather row The rack a tack tacks around the door Then she's up with the rack a tack gypsy -o. Well, it was late last night that the Lord came home Inquiring for his lady-o All the girls said, I never single hand She's gone with the rack a tack gypsy band Settle for me, my milk white steed From my bigger horses, I'm not speedy, yo I go and find the newly wedded bride Who was run for the rack attack gypsy, yo oh, Well, he rode high, he rode low He rode south and north also Till he came to the wide open field And spied that lovely lady, yo Leave your home and your land And why did you leave your money, yo? Why did you leave the newly wedded lord To be up with the rack attack gypsy, yo? She said, oh, what care I for the home and the land And oh, what care I for the money, yo? What care I for my newly wedded lord When I'd rather have the rack attack gypsy, yo? Now, last night you slept in your goose for the bed The sheets turned out so bravely, yo Tonight you'll be in the cold open field And the arms of the rack and tackle gypsy, yo She said the walk here, I for my goose for the bed But me sheets turned out so bravely, yo Tonight I'll be in the cold open field And the arms of the rack and tackle gypsy, yo Oh, you rode high when I rode low You rode south when I rode north I'd rather have the kiss on my yellow gypsy's lips And a mess, me rag a tackle gypsy, yo Here we go! La 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 When you arrive at the Middleton Distillery near Cork, you'll be surprised and perhaps a wee bit confused to find it's called the Jameson Heritage Centre. But that aside, you'll be mesmerised by the scale of this collection of historic buildings, uh, having heard so much already about the myriad of Irish whisky brands actually produced here for the entire Irish Distillers Group, the expectations are certainly high. The earliest records of this building show that it was used as a woolen mill dating from the late 1790s. However, during the Napoleonic Wars it was converted to use as an army barracks. Transformation into a distillery did not take place until 1825 and it was bought by the Murphy brothers who certainly prospered. One of their first additions was a huge wooden water wheel and today you can see the iron replacement that was constructed in 1852. Look closely and you'll notice that sheaves of barley have been cast into the outer rim, a definite reference to the work being done here. Throughout the tour that the visitor embarks upon, the size of the operation will prove most fascinating. The six floors of the grain store, built in 1830, are immense, and when you actually realise that each level could hold 250 tonnes of grain, you will not need to inquire of your guide why such splendid supporting flying buttresses were added to the building.
Moving on past the exhibits, the dimensions of the mash tun and the washbacks appear on a very grand scale. But nothing will prepare you for the sight of the gleaming copper wash dill, which to this day remains the largest of its type in the world. The condition is really quite amazing when you consider that it was more than 25 years ago that this still last ran, and it has indeed fared better than a certain other, though equally famous pot still from this distillery. A great story is told here of a past Middleton distiller by the name of Sandy Ross, who survived one of the most incredible accidents in distilling history. Supervising events one day, a still suddenly exploded, blowing him straight through the window and out into the courtyard. Remarkably, apart from scratches and bruises, the unfortunate chap was thankfully unhurt. However, he can't help feeling that his dignity may have been a little compromised as he found himself surrounded by a crowd of startled colleagues, stark naked except for his shoes and detachable collar. All ended well as the magnanimous management gave him the rest of the day off, sparing the poor man's blushes and allowing him to recover his equilibrium. When you finish looking at the actual whiskey making process here at Middleton, you will quickly realise that this distillery was once completely self-sufficient. Along with distillery staff, there were on-site coopers and even a company fire engine with a fully trained crew. Look out also for a fine collection of vehicles of various ages, all in beautifully restored regalia. As fascinating as the past is, particularly when it has been preserved as evocatively as your discovery it has at Middleton, our attention now moves to the present, and more importantly, the future. The new Middleton Distillery which has already been mentioned during the course of this program as the producer of Jameson and Powers brands, is impossible to miss. But it does little to attract the visitor's notice. Constructed in 1974, the distillery just looks like any industrial unit of the time. But for the privileged few who get the chance to see what actually goes on within this veritable mecca of whiskey production, the reality is something beyond anything that could be imagined. For sheer scale, this distillery is simply mind-blowing, with more than 30 different types of whisky in production. Nevertheless, despite the high-tech methods relied upon here, the familiar sights, sounds and smells of the easily recognisable copper pot stills are very much in evidence. This truly is a marriage of all the very best aspects of traditional whisky making, combined with every advantage that the very latest technological developments can offer. Nothing proves this more convincingly than Middleton's master distiller, Barry Crockett, who you can see here inspecting one of the vast warehouses. Barry was actually born in this wonderful cottage that faces the huge Middleton water wheel, where his father, the then master distiller, lived with his family. It's an enviable pedigree indeed, not to mention a very tangible link with the whiskey making traditions, upheld for more than a century and a half at this perfectly adapted location. There's an old saying that you might hear in these parts, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And for anyone who needs convincing that these mass-produced whiskies are as good as their ancestry, a trip to the Heritage Centre's bar will dispel any doubt. You'll actually see Barry Crockett's signature on the labels of Middleton Very Rare, his much-respected name guaranteeing this exceptional product. 
annual bottling of this limited edition has been taking place since 1984 and it is Ireland's most exclusive whisky. Firstly, you'll experience a very fine scented nose and when you actually taste this heavenly brew, there are distinct hints of almonds, luscious fruit, honey and herbal spice. The finish is rich and velvety and seems to go on forever, much to the delight of anyone who tracks down this wonderful example of the whisky maker's art. It would be impossible to come to Middleton and not search out the famous Paddy whisky that originated in Cork. The official title at the beginning of the 20th century was Cork Distilleries Company Old Irish Whisky, which you have to admit was a bit of a mouthful to ask for at the bar. However, by about 1910, an ebullient salesman for the firm changed all that, and in doing so became a household name in Ireland. Paddy Flaherty knew a thing or two about selling whisky. Spending to accumulate, buying everyone around the drinks at the bar, pretty soon people started to ask for a tot of Paddy Flaherty's whisky, which inevitably got abbreviated to a glass of Paddy's, and the name stuck. Today, you'll find Paddy Old Irish Whisky well represented, and this light, fresh tipple is as palatable as ever. There are some folk who mourn the loss of the small independent whisky distilleries in Ireland, but rationalisation by the Irish Distillers Group has achieved a great deal in a surprisingly short amount of time. Undoubtedly, the future of Irish whisky is now in the safest of hands, and brands that would otherwise quite literally have evaporated into extinction are available for us all to enjoy. As we leave Middleton behind us, our tour of Irish whisky is completed. It's time to move on and consider a couple of very famous drinks in which whisky of the Irish variety is most definitely the key ingredient. There is nothing quite like an Irish coffee to warm the body and soul. With a generous measure of whiskey, rich dark coffee and a topping of velvety soft double cream, it's the epitome of Irish tradition itself. But when you investigate this particular story a little further, you realise that Irish coffee is actually a very recent addition to this fine country's wonderful drinks repertoire. Before the invention of the jet engine, non-stop flights from America to the United Kingdom were the stuff of dreams. But with the advent of flying boats, transatlantic travel was possible, with a brief stopover at Foynes on the west coast of Ireland. The passengers would arrive chilled to the bone, and in 1942, Chef Joe Sheridan came up with the warming Irish coffee to send them off on their way, heartened and cheered to complete the next leg of the journey. We've come to the Arlington, one of Dublin's premier hotels, with the most traditional Irish bar that you could ever hope to find, to see how Irish coffee is made. The whisky is first, crucial and of course, generous and Irish. 
Then the steaming coffee is added in sugar. It's no good missing out the sugar, because if you do, the cream will just not float. The next step requires a teaspoon and a steady hand as the cream is slowly teased into place. The finished result certainly puts you in mind of a perfect pint of Guinness. But one taste and you will know that this is where the similarity ends. And of course, when somebody comes up with a winner of an idea like Irish coffee, it inspires others to experiment with the flavours and ingredients. If you ask any number of people to name Irish drinks, nearly all of them will put Baileys high up on their list. This is an Irish cream liqueur that was launched in 1974 combining cream and whiskey with just a hint of chocolate. It has proved to be phenomenally successful and at the present time accounts for 1% of Ireland's total export trade. It's a drink that truly appeals to all ages, and as you see demonstrated here at the Arlington, the only issue in question is when to add the ice. Watch out for other whiskey cream liqueurs on the market, notably Carolyn's, with a more honeyed flavour, and Emmett's with a toffee and chocolate mellow finish. One of the newest variations upon this theme is Sheridan's, with its distinctive half and half bottle. It has taken a while to become established, because at first perhaps people were suspicious that this was a gimmick, but it really is a spectacular drink that is now extremely popular in its own lucrative niche of this highly specialised market. Like a good evening spent with pleasant company in a traditional Irish bar, it's a sad moment when last orders are called, and you know it's time to wend your merry way homeward. Sadly, our time on this tour of great Irish drinks is also coming to an end. Despite the fact that there are plenty of other wonderful possibilities that we've just not been able to visit on this occasion. Whether it's whiskey that tickles your fancy, a pint of stout, a creamy liqueur or a warming Irish coffee. Hopefully this program will have given you plenty of inspiration to broaden your horizons. However, one thing's absolutely for certain, a taste of the liquid assets of Ireland can prove very satisfactory indeed. And if you get to the shores of the Emerald Isle to imbibe of a glass of whatever is your pleasure, wherever it happened to have been brewed, it will of course taste all the better. So, here's a fine old Irish toast to bid you farewell and to wish you all the very best in traditional style. Health and long life to you, the wife of your choice to you, a child every year to you, the land without rent to you, and may you be half an hour in heaven before the devil knows you're dead. Slantia. Tipperary hurling is the great. Properly, right. Okay, Tipperary hurling is. Wait at for its me. Tipperary hurling. Wait for is me. Go. Tipperary hurling is at its highest. At its Tipperary. 
that we're... I tip! It's a drawing game today, but we will win the next day. I tip! I tip! We have a copy of it. But, uh...